Good morning. This is the New York City Board of Standards and Appeals Public Review Session for December 10th, 2018. We'll begin the appeals calendar decision items. Item number one, 2017 290A, 1558 3rd Avenue, Manhattan. So this one is closed, right? Sorry. No. You have to okay. Have so, to what? Are you accused from this one? No, 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 no. no. She was I was oh, absent. I'm sorry. Yes. yes, I'm sorry. I apologize. So I'm sorry. I apologize to everyone for not being here the last hearing. Um, uh, so I think just to summarize, so that everyone focuses on what's really before us, um, the question before us is whether DOB was in error in interpreting the zoning resolution's definition of zoning lot and the zoning resolution's directions on zoning lot subdivisions by allowing the subdivision of a zoning lot that measures 10 feet deep by 22 feet wide. I do not think DOB was an error. The zoning resolution is vague in its direction, and the 10-foot lot depth it accepted was reasonable given the scant information in the text. I think also, in response to DOB's October 11, 18 letter, um, which it has a footnote 9, that when lot 38 was subdivided, it perforce was subdivided into two zoning lots identified as tax lots 38 and 138 since it is impossible to subdivide a single zoning lot into one zoning lot and one not zoning lot. Otherwise, according to the section 1210 um, subdivision instructions, the subdivision wouldn't have been effective. I think that's actually important. Um, do I think that the zoning lot subdivision was done to intentionally alter the development project so that the sliver law and tower on a base regulations did not apply? Yes. Do I think it should have been allowed to do that? No. But if we, if we at the BSA were to direct DOB to take care of this problem in the future, what would we be asking DOB to do? In most cases, zoning lot subdivisions occur before new building applications are filed and apply to vacant lots or to zoning lots with one or more existing building that will be demolished in the future. Plans for the future building are often not filed for months or even years later. In the meantime, there also may have been subsequent zoning lot mergers with adjacent properties not the subject of the subdivision. So what would DOB have to ask of the applicant to establish that the purpose of the subdivision was to modify the project such that certain provisions of the zoning resolution would hence be inapplicable? And how would it determine whether such modification led to desirable or undesirable results? So I have to agree with Mr. Colgate, who testified at the last hearing, that there just isn't any way for DOB to regulate this problem without city planning creating a minimum standard for zoning lots for all uses as it has done for residential uses. In so doing, city planning should be cognizant of the many variance applications we see at BSA where an owner complains of hardship because, caused by a substandard lot that, absent BSA relief from yard, street wall, or height requirements, cannot be developed. Such a clarification would be easy for city planning if it were willing to look at it, and I encourage them to do so. Other comments? So I and speak loud. I do um, agree on the fact that DOB uh, was correct in its uh, interpretation of the zoning law definition and the subdivision. And uh, I also agree that uh, DOB is not in the position to guess the future development plans of, uh, of any site, given that we, it's not a very, New York City real estate is not a simple one lot you buy and then you develop. There, there are many ways of developing those sites and those are all legal ways of achieving it. And all of those have been met on this site and therefore um, DOB was correct in its task and its duties and responsibilities that it has been given to. If this is a larger issue, this should be, uh, and, and, and if there's a citywide impl implication on this one, it sh really should be city planning reviewing this and clarifying the zoning uh, through zoning regulations. I agree with both of you, actually. I believe that 
DOB mm -hmm. made a proper interpretation as to the validity of the zoning lot. And I so probably differ perhaps with the chair in that I think that while the uh, developer um, apportioned the zoning lot out in the way that they did to maximize the development potential, I personally don't think there's anything wrong with that because I think that's what everybody does. You read the zoning resolution and you try and build as much as you can as large a valid envelope as you possibly can based on what the requirements are. And so if we want to tighten this up, the tightening has to come from city planning. Mm -hmm. No, you have no final I believe the subdivision is a division in name alone, and the practical uh, matter remains that, and it's apparent from the drawings that the primary use of Lot 138 is to be an extension of Lot 37. The division itself does not address the specific harms the zoning resolution were, were intended to protect against. All it does is skirt Lot 37's requirement to comply with zoning. Um, the notice of objection from May of 2016, I think, is very telling. Uh, but that being said, I, I do appreciate the dilemma of how DOB can regulate this in the future. Okay. Move on. Item number two, new cases, 2017-263A, 6266 West Broadway, Manhattan. This is being postponed. Yes. Special order calendar, continued <coughs> hearing items. Item number three, 93328BZ, 12524 Metropolitan Avenue, Queens. Um, there's a survey showing all walls and fences within the subject property. We had asked about mm -hmm. that. Um, and the en <coughs> engineer's letter states the brick wall appears plumb and in stable condition. We asked them to have an engineer look at that wall. A lumen spread diagram was provided that shows, except that the intersection of the side lot line with the sidewalk, zero lumen levels on neighboring properties. At the intersection, the level jumps from 7.8 to zero foot candles, which I, is difficult to understand unless there is a shield, but it's very close to the sidewalk. So I'm not sure whether that's really a problem. It's on, and it's at the corner, and um, right. It, no, it's not at the corner. It's adjacent, adjacent to, to a residential, a, a residential the property, residential. but it's it's maybe eight feet or something in from the street line. Mm -hmm. So, and it's obviously one of those kind of tall um, for shares where maybe they could put a shield on it. Um, and that would eliminate that, but you also do want to light the sidewall. I'm not sure if you can accomplish both with a shield. Probably, maybe. I, I um, we discussed at the last hearing that there is excessive signage. Drawings were provided to show that it complies, even though photos show a haphazard signage in poor condition. I would ask that the owner clean that up. I mean, it doesn't need to be one of every imaginable sign type attached randomly to a post. Um, why can't they <coughs> buy some signs that accomplish the task and still comply? Um, the asphalt also looks like it's in need of resurfacing, and trash and tires are being stored outside of the storage area. They shouldn't be. And we asked that the owner look at the decorative fencing located across the street from the site to enclose this site along the perimeter so as to keep the parking spaces on the site as opposed to hanging over into the sidewalk and maybe it discourages sidewalk parking. The site plan only shows parking for five cars, whereas um, when you look at the photographs that are provided and satellite images, the place is packed with cars, so I don't really understand how the five um, is adequate. At the last hearing, there was agreement about installing planting along the property line adjacent to residential, and I don't see it on the drawings and certainly not installed. We also asked for more dimensions on the site plan between pumps and the street widening line and the location of the structure and the outside dimensions of the structure. So like the site, the structure on the lot, and then what are the out-to-out -out dimensions of the structure. Um, the, there's an existing pump that's outside of the street widening line. So I, you know, who knows what's going to happen in the future, whether that's actually going to be pursued. But right now there's a pump sitting on future roadway. 
Any other I, I just want to add to the lighting and I'm looking at the lumen. I, I think the reason that may be because the abutting property, um, that these, the, that's on a raised uh, elevation. And so not only there is a four foot high wall, on top of it, there is a fence. With screening. Um, with, with screening. So right. that might be the reason why the, the drop is so sudden, in mm -hmm. addition to whatever other um, devices ah. that's been done. Maybe the applicant Maybe. can clarify right. that, but that would be uh, one of the reasons why we have a very precipitous drop, drop lumen. Well, it would only, that would work if it was dropped. Then you're closer to the light source. But if you're up high enough, it might actually be just on the ground, like right. focusing oh, on the yeah. ground of the backyard. Okay. Right, is, is Any the other board, comments on this? Is the board satisfied with the chain link fence with privacy panels, or we have, are they sticking? Or on other cases, we do prefer a white picket fence or a picket fence. I'm just wondering if the board is. We which which um, along the one along the residences along the residences because they had said that that was the residents themselves putting it up, which is mm -hmm. why it was like kind of mismatched because each yeah. resident mm -hmm. put up their own yeah. rear fence. But Though they we said had they are going to put up a fence on that line, if I'm not mistaken. I thought it was on the 129th no. Street yeah. frontage, and and mistaken. there we had suggested that they look at some of the abutting businesses that have used. On the street, on yeah. the yeah. street fronted uh, fences. And keep in line. That right. That is more attractive and more in keeping. It's not opaque, but it allows for um, something better than just a chain link fence. Right, and, and it's more us, residential in character. Yeah. They gave us two options. I guess they wanted us to choose. Um, they did. Two options for. Yeah, they gave us two photographs and basically yeah. said we could do the one across the street or we could do another one that's that's very close by. I think either. And they're they're they didn't a little it. fancier than you did. Like yeah. one of them has like cut out mm -hmm. and then. Not on this framework. submission. On the on this submission, they gave us I, options. I thought I, I remember reading the options. Saying, and there were two low fences of parking lots. One was a pharmacy parking lot. Right. And um, I don't right. remember where the other one was for. Here, these are the choices. The yeah. fence options. Oh, so okay. yeah, it's nice right. cut out. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this was one option. And the other option. Well, that's the existing brick fence. That's yes. Mm -hmm. But I think this is the one which I that, yeah. mm -hmm. This was across the street, I yeah. think. Right. Well, um, we're looking at a photograph which has the cutout with squares. Of right, paper. right. And, and they're both decorative, so right. they so. can pick whichever one. Mm -hmm. Right. That one's nice. Yeah, yeah I squares. like that one. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess that's you know, the, the privacy panels. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this Hopefully it's into feasible. Circles. Right. No. <laughs> okay. Move on. Yeah. Are any other comments? Um, so, yeah. Okay. Is that any other comments? Do no. You? no, no, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Special order item number four, one forty one oh six BZ twenty eighty four sixty eight Street, Brooklyn. Did the commissioner see the FDNY's recent letter, um, on December seventh? Let me see. Mm, I don't no. read it. Yeah. Um, yeah. The oh, commission will no. approve it. No, no, it was them um, stating that they could not access the roof and that they needed to revise the Schedule A to note 100 person occupancy. Right. I thought we were not going to allow any access no, to the roof. Right. And exactly. there isn't any elevator and there isn't any stair bulkhead either. So they, uh, the Schedule A should not even show any roof occupancy or any load of 100 person. Right. And, um, Wait, when they, sorry, the fire department letter says who can't access the fire department? The fire department can't access the, the roof, roof, and they right. need a, a plan that shows that they would be able to gain access. And then in the meanwhile, it says also modify your Schedule, schedule. A to note that there will be 100 people on the roof. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there won't a be 100 people us. on the roof. Yeah. Right. right, because my note said at the last hearing there was a comment you wanted the fire department to look at. There was a stair, no stairways? Yeah, going yeah, because up. the stairs, 
thing yeah, yeah. to the no. right. R right, and they have provided photos indicating that the stair bulkhead has been. No, 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 that's the elevator, elevator bulkhead. No. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Right. 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 So the, right. yeah, the elevator bulkhead was removed, but there's still a stair that should go to the roof. Um, there, is a, there is a stair, a stair. Uh, that is from the residential portion. There is a um, exterior staircase that uh, goes from the balcony. Right. Right. That's why I asked fire department. You um, said that you want a fire yes. department to look at that. That's why? Right. Uh, right. Oh, I see the. the there's a ladder that goes right, from right. the balcony yes. to the roof. Right. Which is arguably not adequate access for fire department. Yeah, so no, they. What? It's the letter is called conditional approval. So I believe I believe they are okay with the condition indicated in the letter. We'll get fire department to talk to, to mm -hmm. testify tomorrow. Um, yeah. Can you? Yeah. Push his button. It's on. It's on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and then we also need the side elevation that faces the adjoining property with the material called out and indicating translucent 50 dBA rated windows? I think they did. The, they, no, this, there's a missing side elevation. The side elevation that faces the neighbor. Okay. They have three elevations, not four. Um, and, um, and eliminate the, there's a, I, we asked the last hearing that they take the windows out that are facing the neighbor that are in a closet. There's still a window There's in the closet. Right. I thought they made those windows translucent and soundproof, and like SCT 50 soundproof on those windows facing the neighbor. They may have done, but there's no elevation, so how do you know? Um, none of the elevations show also the decorative details that are shown in the renderings, and DOB doesn't get renderings, so they need to show the decorative details on the elevations themselves. Um, and. Uh, I think we had com conditions also, um, uh, no commercial catering, no commercial spa or mikvah use for other than congregants and their guests. Um, and, um, no use of the roof. The FDNY letter also stated that um, the sprinkler, they have reviewed the sprinkler plan, but it does not show the installation of a fire department connection, so that fire department also recommended an FD connection to be installed for the fire department use. Mm -hmm. okay. I think we also asked at the last hearing if they can close the balcony uh, to the rear. I see... Um, they increase the height. It, say again. The say balcony in the rear I, at the last <coughs> hearing, I thought... We asked them to explore closing the balcony in the rear uh, for the benefit of the neighbor, the rear neighbors. They, they raised the fence higher. That's, that's if the, the board's satisfied with the higher fence. I mean, so the issue is always you can't use the balcony for events. It's a small balcony, right? So it's a technically it's a residential balcony. So to say they can't have a residential balcony. And it's not a balcony that protrudes over the street, which I have a real issue with. Mm -hmm. It's set back, and it's at the rear of the building. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, my big concern was they were going to use it for events, but it's not a very big balcony. Mm -hmm. So, if anything, maybe it fits 20 people. And how high is that? That what I'd like to know what that fencing is. It's 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 described as five feet high. I'm not sure that's even allowed under. Well, it creates floor area when it's five feet high. Mm -hmm. That's true. So they need to include that floor area in the calculations. And I don't know if anyone said they also removed the bulkhead and showed yeah. photos. Right, the yeah. elevator bulkhead. Elevator yeah, right. bulkhead. Yes. Waiting for okay. Item number five, 1809 BZ, 250 West 54th Street, Manhattan. I'm recusing on it. So I believe there has been some delay um, in uh, the fire alarm and the sprinkler application processing has been delayed due to um, 
portion of the property that is not included in the plan and that that needs to be revised and reflected in the plan and um, they also need to apply for the PA permit and need to provide two means of egress from the PCE so based on those those plans are being finalized and until then I don't think we can weigh in on it so Ready? Mm -hmm. Item number six, 6213BZ, 2703 East Tremont Avenue, the Bronx. Okay, the um, photos from October 10th, um, which is earlier but than our last hearing, but still um, show the dumpster outside of the trash storage area. So I don't know what the point of that is. Dumpster has to be maintained inside. It's quite a large trash storage area. Um, the photos, we were waiting for them to do the planting, so they show ground cover in the planting beds. So I don't know if that there were any other issues. They may have to wire both sides of the of the planting beds. Um, there is only wiring on one side to avoid from people walking onto the huh. uh, through it. The only reason I say they might have to wire both sides is in the photos you see vehicles very very close to those those plants, and I'm not sure how those plants are going to survive under those conditions. Uh, they also stated that they were going to plant more when uh, it's in season. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure, I'd like to know where and how many uh, they were planning on planting. Don't we have a landscaping, we have a landscaping plan. I don't no? think that shows the, 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 well, layout? the, the layout of the, the statement that they were going to plant more. No, it, doesn't show the it doesn't show the additional planting that they're... I do think the landscaping that, as we see on the photos provided is a little bit on the sparse side, but right. maybe they have just been pl planted and they haven't grown. That could yeah, be the it, reason. It's a ground cover that they're planting, mm -hmm. which is, and you plant it as though it's kind of spacing, so mm -hmm. it eventually fills in if it survives the winter. Problem is, they planted late in the season. Um, you know, sort of good luck on those plants. So it, it, um, yeah. I guess the condition will be continue to maintain the uh, landscaping. Yes. Planting. On. But it'd be good if we, um, <coughs> just to verify that we have a landscaping plan that shows, um, I, didn't, I didn't check again the landscaping plan because nothing new was submitted on that. Just to show what the scope of the landscaping is, do we have that? It just says existing flowering plants type, and I think it may actually say the type, but it doesn't say anything about ground cover being planted. I think the type of plants that they planted are only get two to three feet high. Yeah, that's it. So that might be what they're considering as ground cover. Yeah, yeah. Well, ground, right, exactly. It's just a, like a low juniper right. or something that they planted. Oh, it, it's it like says ground. existing flowering plants. Oh, sorry. Landscaped areas tip. I mean, should, I guess maybe we should have a condition that says that landscaping will be replanted as needed. Yeah. As opposed to just maintained, which yes. may, you know, be like, oh, well, we tried to maintain it. <laughs> right. We were not successful. Okay. New cases, item number 7509-37BZ, 202-01 Rocky Hill Road, also known as 202. 0247th Avenue, Queens. Wait a minute, we're putting Rocky Hill Road in a different place, sorry. Okay. Um, okay. We have proof of service of initial application and of notice of hearing to officials. Community board recommends conditional approval, but didn't provide their committee report that included the conditions, although the borough president's recommendation summarizes them. Um, which I'll summarize too because maybe they're included in our conditions. Um, uh -oh. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, they said 
They approved for a five-year term with the following conditions. The applicant should provide the manager's contact information to resolve any site issues. Illuminated signage should be turned off at night. The building and site should be power washed. A tree stump in front of the front office should be removed. Removal of dead vehicle storage. Removal of loose tire pile and excess garbage, including weeds. Confirmation that the security camera works. Implementation of a tag system to ensure all cars being worked on are within the legal bounds of the CFO. Repair the metal grating on the window. No storage of vehicles and all repair work to be done in the work bays, not in the parking lot or city streets. We also have a letter from um, Borough President Melinda Katz recommending conditional approval, um, also recommending a five-year term and that the uh, applicant should maintain the premises free of debris, weeds, and graffiti. All of the work should be done in the building, not on the sidewalk or parking lot, and no storage of cars except cars awaiting service. Um, these are my notes. The site is adjacent to residential use. I don't, don't think there should be, bu I do think there should be buffering hedges along the shared property line that fronts on Rocky Hill Road. The building must be properly painted on all sides and with special care for the side facing the residence that's next door. The asphalt needs to be resurfaced before striping. And I'm looking at the layout and I don't see the need for that curb cut on 200 Second Street. Mm -hmm. If that were eliminated, you could put a railing along the property line to prevent cars from extending onto the sidewalk. Um, also might discourage sidewalk parking. I think the trash enclosure is too short in height um, and needs an opaque gate. Um, and it's adjacent to a private home, um, so it's not the ideal location. It's imposing the trash on, on the residents. Um, I'd like to know how the proposed striping for seven spaces coordinates with the reality of 19 cars parked on the site in the satellite image and similar numbers in the photos provided. Um, I also don't like the idea of a storage container as a permanent solution next to the building, especially when it's visible from the street and adjacent to residential. I don't understand why the materials can't be stored inside the building. Um, signage needs to be shown on the drawings and compliance with C1 regulations. Um, those were my comments. Anybody else? Um, no, I agree with you. I do think that uh, the curb cut the on 202 can be removed and um, that would allow for more parking on the street and uh, oh, sorry. on the sidewalk. I'm I mean, sorry. Thank you lot, for collecting. You on the lot. <laughs> on the lot. I, I meant on the lot. And you and there are two means of egresses that mm -hmm. uh, I think that flows into the circulation of uh, the rest of the street network. Um, the trash, I agree with you, that the wall can be a little bit higher uh, or there could maybe an opaque fence put on top of that uh, wall. Could be another way of doing it. I don't know. The um, idea is not to create something super ugly, which right. is often the case with these trash enclosures. I think we should actually create a standard for all the trash enclosures need to look like this because we look like something specific because we get such haphazard versions of trash enclosures and they're really kind of jerry rigged, you know. So, um, with regards to the metal container, um, we have approved other projects uh, where there has been metal container which has been used for storage of material. Uh, I think in this case if that metal container is to be there maybe it can be just uh, fenced in a way that uh, that's less of a concern. I mean short of expanding the building which the building cannot. Uh, I, I recognize that they need a storage space. This is a really small footprint for mm -hmm. a uh, repair shop. That right. We have so seen. With the metal containers, sometimes we say we put them in their own their own enclosed area that has the fencing all the way around, but so you're not visible from the street, as opposed to like this. Right. right. That could be the way to mm -hmm. address that issue. Any other comments? Um, they said they have 29.3 square feet of um, signage, but I didn't see it in the photos, and I know they removed the sign from the corner, which they showed us photos of that. So I did not see it on the building, and it's supposedly facing Rocky Hill Road. So if they could just tell us where, that'd be helpful. And I think in the plan, they do need to show where the signage will be. Maybe it's it's not been finalized, so they need to identify where the proposed signage would be. Mm -hmm. And same thing with lighting. 
we do not have a, a lumen plan uh, which indicates the spread. Right. Um, okay. And I would suggest if we do, I, I really have not seen an argument for keeping the curb cut on 22nd Street. And if that 200 can, uh, 202nd Street, uh, if that can be closed, then we can have a street tree planted. Mm -hmm. And that would also enhance. And also discourages sidewalk parking. Yes. <coughs> okay. mm -hmm. Item number eight, 17699 BZ, 4517 Marathon Parkway, Queens. Okay. Um, we have proof of notice of hearing to officials, but I didn't find proof of service of initial application. You have it. You have it? Okay. Um, although both community board and borough president um, weighed in on this. Um, community board recommends approval with a 10 year term. Uh, borough president Katz recommends approval. Photos show very good fencing and landscaping screening at the rear property line adjacent mm -hmm. to residential. The site looks like it's in very good shape. Mm -hmm. Surprising because we're not used to seeing sites that look this good. <laughs> Um, the approved landscape plan showed three-inch caliber, caliper red maple trees along the property line, but without planting beds to put them in, um, and no clearance from the property line. Um, so that's the thing about when you don't have a landscape architect do a drawing, you just throw a tree shape in, I don't know what. So the only way these would work is to reduce, relocate, or eliminate the driveway into the parking area. So I don't know why those were shown there ever, frankly. Um, the proposed landscape plan should be specific about the number and type of plantings that are currently in place for future use. Um, and I didn't see where the trash is stored and how it's managed. This is some professional offices, so presumably there's medical related trash and all that stuff. It's a realty company. Realty? Oh, I thought it was. And I think they need a signage analysis yeah. form because they have lettering on the front wall. Which oh. I think exceeds more than the required 150 square feet. Um, and there's also another signage on the western wall. So both of those need to be included um, in the elevation and the analysis. signage analysis plan and the calculations. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Um, oh. I'd like to see uh, the proof that, that trees were not permitted on Marathon Parkway. They made a statement saying that they weren't permitted to, to, to plant trees on Marathon Parkway. And while I see the difficulties, I, I'd like to see proof of that. Give me a letter from the Parks Department or DOT or somebody? Something along those lines. Hmm. There's probably <coughs> something when you go on um, Department of Parks website that has uh, sort of the uh, moratorium areas where you can't do it. <coughs> and if you, look at, if you look at the site, you'll see that the sidewalk is smaller uh, than, than the sidewalk up the block. It cuts in. So I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that that's not the case, although mm -hmm. I'd like to see some evidence because they were supposed to have that in place. I think that e even in this case, they should find somewhere else to plant, um, if well, there is. Yeah. But so usually reasons. when you're required to build a building, and but this building probably re predates, that, that, predates that, that, that period, when you build a building, you're required to plant trees, right? Mm -hmm. And if you can't put them in front of your building for technical reasons, then you, you pay into a fund and the trees get pay, planted someplace else. So in this case, um, there's not a relationship with the fund because it's not a new building. Um, that, that's the problem. So, um, Did we say that they are seeking a 20-year term, mm -hmm. even though the community board had recommended yes. 10 years? Right. So we should talk about that. Um, Borough President Katz didn't, I don't think, wasn't specific about the term. Okay. Item number 9, 48-10BZ, 2965 West Veterans Road, West Staten Island. 
Right, this is a legalization um, to increase uh, the PCE floor area on the first floor by 3,050 square feet um, to allow for Pilates stretching room. We have proof of service of initial application and have notice of hearing to officials. Community board recommends approval. We have fire department sign off. Um, I need from them the total area of the cellar that's devoted to PCE and the total floor area of the first floor devoted to PCE as compared to the approved project. We actually don't have that number anywhere in the application. Um, oh. Okay. So what are we going to need? Uh, anybody else on this one? No. Okay. I think they need to update their photos. Um, the photos are from 2016 and shows a previous owner. Uh, so I, I like some updated site photos. What do you mean it shows a pre It shows retro fitness oh. as opposed to this. Uh, and I was trying to find some information about uh, the type of gym Campbell Fitness is, um, but I wasn't able to find. I did find some material, but I'm not sure if it's associated with this location. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good point. Was the application originally made for retro fitness? It, it, it was. Uh, retro fitness is the predecessor. They did do the they did properly change it from from what I read. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, 2017. DBA. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No. Because the sign they, still says retro when you go to the oh, site. It still says yeah, retro. Yeah, retro fitness. Okay. Because um, they got a letter of substantial compliance in 2017, changing ownership. So whatever the actual ownership is, um, Campbell Fitness. Um, that's who it could be doing right. Yeah, yeah that so could very well be the case. Yeah. Clarify. Appeals count. Can I go on? Appeals calendar continued hearing items. Item number 10, 2016, 4142A through 4146A. This is Cunard Avenue in Staten Island. We have a letter from City Planning dated December 7th, um, which articulately expresses their strong opposition to the project, both in terms of the impact on the Special Hillside Preservation District and on both access options that were proposed here. Um, I think it's a little bit long, but did everybody read mm -hmm. the City Planning? Because um, yes. it's quite... It's detailed. quite detailed. Mm -hmm. I think I'll read it because it helps explain our thinking, how we should be thinking. City planning has significant concerns regarding access to the proposed homes. Because the site is irregularly shaped and contains a substantial amount of steep slope, city planning noted that the applicant team should explore potential development options that minimize disturbance to steep slope as per the goals of the uh, Special Hillside Preservation District. This suggestion was contingent upon receiving sign-off from other areas, agencies, including DOT and fire department. At interagency meetings, the access proposed by applicant raised concerns about the ability to provide adequate circulation and turnaround for emergency vehicles. Further concerns were raised about creating access by chaining together, which is what we've been looking at a, uh, a series of unmapped roads that would result in a volume of traffic on an existing private road, Cedar Terrace, that was never contemplated. The above concerns are well-founded given the nature of applicants' proposed access. Cedar Terrace is not a final map street. It only has a CCO opinion and is built out to an irregular width of between 20 and 30 feet. The proposed access would then rely on a new private road segment on lot 237 off of Cedar Terrace to provide access to a third segment consisting of an unbuilt section of Cunard Avenue. This would result in an access road independently controlled by multiple owners. Um, such multi-segmented access is inconsistent with a safe and well-planned road network. The alternative access, which would involve extending Cunard Avenue, similarly raises a number of issues. Cunard Avenue is not a final map street, does not have a CCO, and does not meet the zoning definition of a street, contrary to applicants' assertions. Moreover, the lower portion of Cunard Avenue is only partially improved to approximately 23 feet wide, as it is in an ecologically sensitive steep slope area. 
While the western and northern portions of Cunard Avenue are not open or improved at all, which includes the portion that fronts the proposed residences. City planning has also been informed that the grading of Cunard does not allow for the safe passage of emergency vehicles. In light of these safety and ecological concerns, as well as recent citywide private road policy, and we're finding out what more specifically they mean by that, but we know that lots of agencies are working on the subject of private roads. Um, City planning believes that the applicant team should explore alternative development scenarios focused on where the site has existing frontage along improved streets, including Wandell Avenue, which is a final map street. Although city planning understands that this site presents a unique set of challenges in which the goals of the um, special hillside preservation district must be balanced with the goals of providing safe access to proposed development. City planning does not believe this proposal demonstrates how those objectives are being met. Therefore, city planning does not believe it would be appropriate to issue a GCL 36 waiver at this time. To the extent that the applicant amends its proposal to locate proposed development along existing streets, city planning would re-examine its position. So <clears throat> my comments are city planning's 2015 interdivisional meeting meeting record acknowledges that BSA handles GCL waivers where needed and appropriate. Um, the applicant made reference to that, that, those notes, that record, stating that it was directed to come here before it went to city planning. Um, city planning, however, cannot speak for BSA's process or the order in which it reviews applications that are subject to review by other agencies. The city planning 2018 letter makes clear that the application before BSA is submitted in the wrong order. It also should remind everyone that the subject of private roads is undergoing extreme scrutiny by many New York City agencies and policies are changing. So what may have been the case in 2015 is no longer the case. I think this application is premature and further that because it has to go through ULERP, ULERP it should pursue a mapping action simultaneously. That tandem application makes sense, particularly in light of the sensitive nature of this natural area. And there is no excuse or hardship for not approaching it that way since they would travel together as a classic ULERP. Um, I think one of the approvals is an authorization but that's right. effectively a Euler action. Um, any other comments on this? I completely agree with your statement. I completely agree with your statements. Okay. Move on. Yep. Item number 11, 2016-4296A to 4298A. This is 36, 30, 3236. 3238 Schley Avenue and 580 Clarence Avenue, the Bronx. Um, there is a request for an adjournment. However, I will, um, we received, well, actually we didn't receive, the applicant received um, an approval from uh, DEP. It was addressed to the, um, to the architect, Mr. Longo. DEP has reviewed their resubmittal of this feasibility study and the information at this time is sufficient to determine the drainage plan can be amended. Therefore, this application will be considered and closed. So they have to oh. move forward on amending the drainage plan. Hmm. This is a result okay. of the meeting we had with DEP, the staff oh. had with DEP, and uh, they've agreed that they uh, can amend the drainage plan so the applicant will have to move forward on that. Okay. That's good news. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then our adjournment would give them time to amend the drainage plan. And right, and then res they respond to, to anything else. DEP, though. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess we can condition it or whatever, but um, um, they still have to um, some make submission, I think, on some of the other couple of other things. Okay. Um, uh, new cases, item number 12, 12 2017-316A, 95 Andrevet Street, Staten Island. Okay, we have proof of service of initial application and of notice of hearing to officials. Community board recommends approval with one opposed. Um, Borough President Otto had many comments that the applicant should address. Um, it's very long, so I just would like the applicant to specifically address every point yeah. made by the Borough yeah. President. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm assuming um, the applicant received a copy yes. of this. Okay. The site is accessed by CCO Andrevet Street, which is 30 to 50 feet wide 
and CCO Kreisner Street, which is 42 to 50 feet wide. There are many other structures on both streets. Um, the proposal here is commercial in an M11. We have an email from city planning stating that they don't have comments on the application and that um, the cross access regulations do not apply to the alleyway adjacent. There's a little skinny alleyway behind. Um, I'm not familiar with the cross access regulations. So. Um, DEP had an April 16th letter that requests the applicants <coughs> submit a plan, quote, showing proposed method of disposing of sanitary storm discharge and available water for the proposed development. Um, the applicant, so they need to do that. The applicant submitted drawings showing DOB approval of an on-site sewage treatment system. And there is a permit from DOB for a temporary individual on-site private sewage disposal system. Um, did my question is did the applicant submit that to DEP so you yes. said okay um, we said okay. Sorry. After the applicant sets up. so we haven't heard yet but okay okay we need a restrictive declaration recorded against the property obliging the owner to maintain the street bed sidewalks and all utilities and I'm saying that because DEP's letter said that you're responsible for the sewers and the water mains so um, there is a DOB approved builders pavement plan but no indication of DOT approval um, and we need so we need DOT and fire department to comment on this Anybody else? I just wanted to know a little bit more about the on-site water retention. Um, I, I did see some some uh, statements with regard to the other on-site, the on-site sewage, but I didn't see much about the on-site water retention unit. So, okay, it says proposed method of sanitary storm discharge and available water. So they didn't, yeah. City planning was just talking about disposal of sanitary storm discharge and available water as opposed to a detention system. I don't know whether that's the same thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mulan? Yeah. Zoning calendar item number 13, 7715 BZ, 244 36 85th Avenue, Queens. They requested an adjournment. Item number 14, 2016, 4171 BZ, 823 Kent Avenue, Brooklyn. So we have fire department conditional sign off on this application. Um, dated October 15th. Uh, so given fire department's concerns though, it is extremely important that all conditions are satisfied and clearly indicated on the plans and the resolution. So I wanna go over them um, because fire department first thought this was doable, then they thought it was a terrible idea, so they've gone back and forth and I want to be cognizant of their concerns. Um, they state, the existing two-story frame building must be fully sprinklered. Any future structures constructed on the remaining portion, which is the subject of this application, must be fully sprinklered. The eight-foot side yard shall be maintained clear at all times. There shall be no parking anytime the length of the side yard. A separate address sign shall be installed on or near the front lot line indicating the address of the rear building. And the rear building will install a security system that connects to a company um, providing continuous supervision that will monitor heat, smoke, carbon monoxide, and sprinkler flow. So all those notes need to be shown on the site plan. And I would like a restrictive declaration to commit to the fire department obligations uh, that's recorded against the property prior to resolution issuance. Um, should the installation, I'm asking that, maybe I'm asking the fire department, but also the, the commissioners, should perhaps the installation of sprinklers and security systems as outlined by fire department um, in the existing building take place prior to permit on the front building to ensure that it will happen. Because as soon as construction begins on the front building, you're compromising access to the rear building. So, you know, there's construction in the way, there's blockage of that <coughs> access point, all that stuff. So maybe... I think that's a good yeah, idea. I think that's so, good. So, and also... Um, I'm thinking somebody would have to move. 
in the back building. Like How old is to get to the street? Once they start clearing the front building you and could, excavating, yeah. unless they maintain that eight foot clearance, they could maintain the eight foot. If it's totally like fence. fenced off, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. That could be also a condition. Yeah, but it's it's a condition. All of this will be a condition, but our conditions only go so far because who reads our resolution? But a restrictive declaration mm -hmm. recorded against the property puts everybody on notice. Um, also. Uh, Wanted how we control the access to the rear building and prevent parking on it. One of the questions Commissioner Otley Brown raised at a prior hearing was who owns that eight foot strip? Who had, and so it seems to me um, somehow or other if the lots were subdivided, the ownership of the strip should belong to the to back the building, right? And then the, and have exclusive access to it so that the front building isn't using it as parking because if it does, then it ends up being a tandem situation where you block um, the, the, all the materials need to be shown on the elevations. Um, there's a balcony still shown projecting over the property line. Um, we discussed this several times. I think that it should be changed to a Juliet balcony as shown on the second floor. He changed the second floor to Juliet, but the third floor is still two foot something extending onto the front. Um, um, there's already access from the third floor apartment to a roof terrace, so I'm not sure why you need the balcony at the front and you could put it at the rear. Uh, that's a change they made. It's it's no longer exclusively for the third right. floor. It's now, uh, I guess, like a party room or some kind yeah, of recreation yeah. room for the entire building. Right. I'm trying to understand that, too, because I don't know why you would build such a thing, frankly, in such a little building. Um, so, and I just want to say that the, they refer to balconies across the street. For, ex for the reasoning for why this building should have a balcony, and I think they're an eyesore, and I don't think balconies should be projecting on BSA applications over the property line. Um, uh, there's still a four-foot high fence forward of the property line that we discussed at other hearings. It should be shown on the drawings as to be removed and a condition of approval. Um, then, I, then I'd like to understand what in the world is that penthouse thing? because um, it's accessible from the main stair and to which unit does it belong and yeah like why really why would you build it um, for a, a building with so few units um, and how does anyone access the rear of the roof because there's this structure in the way fire department would care about that um, there's no door that allows access to the rear of the roof I don't I actually don't think it's legal um, there are three rectangles shown on the roof plan. What are they? Skylights, mechanicals, they need to be identified. The architect must come to the hearing. I don't want to have this conversation with the lawyer and then have no answers. Um, the drawing 10A that added a sight line from across the street oddly has the person on the street looking up at the sky. Um, I, I just find this whole thing about sight lines very funny because um, the architect seems to have no experience with sight lines, which, again, that's kind of architecture school, like, first day. Um, when I do it myself, though, to just see whether the penthouse is visible from the street, it's not visible um, from across the street, but it will be visible over the shorter building um, next door that's only 30 feet high. This building is 38 feet high. I j this is just to point out that the building is taller than its neighbors and we never received the information requested about where the 37 foot height at 825 Kent is measured to. Is it measured to the top of the roof or the top of the bulkhead? And I'm asking because it's a three-story building that seems tall um, based on their measurements. Uh, we also required a phase two. Um, I don't know whether that was provided. I didn't find one. And um, we had open air quality and hazmat. And we still and do it. Yeah. And, and noise. They yeah. Off, or they were holding off to see. Yeah, yeah, sure, I understand. They were holding off on really pursuing a lot of our comments because they didn't know about fire department. Okay. Anybody else? Go on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Item number 16, 2016 4274 BZ, 141139 Street, Brooklyn. And item number 17, 2016, 40. 
I'm Can sorry. Skip Mansion, Mansion Avenue. Mansion. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know if I got sorry, it. sorry. I apologize. <laughs> Item number 15, 2016, 42, 39 BZ, 180 Manson Avenue, Staten Island. Manson. Manson, not Manson, right? Manson. Manson. Okay, good. <coughs> you good. say potato, I say potato. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they requested an adjournment. That's probably why I read it. Item number 16, 16 2016, 4274 BZ, 1411 39th Street, Brooklyn. And item number 17, 2016, 4339 BZ, 5018, 14th Avenue, Brooklyn. Okay. Um, according to the cover letter, um, the, um, I'm jumping into buses. That's just where we started. The buses are currently stored at a 26,000 square foot lot on 1352 36th Street, which is in a CA2 district. There is a new lease for that site as of September 1, running until August 2019, with a 60-day landlord option vacate provision, also tenant option vacate provision. An application was just filed at DOB to construct a school at that site. Um, the subject, uh, but the subject school intends to enter into a 10-year lease effective immediately <clears throat> with 1432 62nd Street to park their 13 buses on that lot. That 31,000 square foot vacant lot has a certificate of occupancy that allows public parking. The lessor is known as, of that parking lot, is known as Residential Management of 1561 Coney Island Avenue. I'd like to know what the relationship of that entity is to the fee owner of the proposed parking lot that is shown on the deed as being 1453 62nd Realty LLC. The lesser has to have the right to lease the property. It's kind of basic um, real estate law, right? Um, we had requested a restrictive declaration committing to off-site parking, so it, they, their, their proposed lease um, puts the obligation on the lessor to find an alternate place for parking, but it's not the lessor's responsibility, it's the lessee's responsibility to make sure they're always parking the buses off-site. Um, and then at the last hearing, we discussed the applicant's proposal that bollards be installed at the 39th Street location and how this would be accomplished. We received no nothing further on this, as far as I'm aware. Bollards are still indicated as proposed on the VHB traffic report at page 7. There is no indication that applicant reached out to DOT on this. Um, applicant prepared affidavits from business owners stating that they are um, low traffic generating uses. So this is the applicant preparing an affidavit that the neighbors signed. Um, it's not exactly um, an arm's length. <laughs> transaction and that all deliveries pickups are quote preferred to be scheduled prior to 9 a.m. and after 4 p.m. so how does that coordinate with school drop-offs and how do we account for the forklifts that operate during the day um, and if you add up all the estimated deliveries of the businesses that responded there are at least 38 deliveries per day that's a lot of deliveries all of it with potentially large trucks and um, they said preferred to be scheduled prior to 9 and after 4, but, you know, there's traffic. So um, that doesn't really address the issue of the traffic conflict with students. Um, I didn't find any diagrams in the study to indicate where the crossing guards, bollards, and other safety measures are or would be located. DOT school safety provided a letter of November 28th requiring the following modica modifications that should be shown on the site plans. Um, it says, we request that the school construct a concrete half curb extension on the northwest corner of 51st at 14th Avenue. Um, the curb extension will provide additional pedestrian space for students crossing 14th Avenue. Um, then the school must close unutilized existing curb cuts along the proposed school frontage um, and then names the two curb cuts. I'm assuming the applicant got a copy of this DOT letter. And then on 39th Street, um, their DOT just directed the applicant to contact someone at DOT revocable consents concerning the bollards. So I 
they should have done that. So we had an answer to whether these bollards are actually a possibility. And then uh, for that same site on 39th, they must close unutilized existing curb cuts. Um, and then they name the two locations. So that needs to be shown on the drawings, the closure of those curb cuts. Okay, DEP's um, November 14th letter on noise requires sound attenuation at the windows of both locations. This should be shown on the plans and be a condition of approval. Um, with respect to air quality, I didn't see that DEP signed off on air quality for industrial sources at 39th Street in terms of the current conditions effect on the students that were included in their comment letters of August 10th and September 27th. I see the applicant responded to this on October 16th, but no DEP sign off for industrial sources. The way that their letter reads is you won't cause any problems. You school, but we don't know about the impact of the spraying. It's just a general like, comment like, that encompasses that we reviewed everything including industrial sources, but the wording is often yeah. doesn't. So if we could get an improved wording even in an email to show that because there was issues about a spray booth next door that doesn't have permits and um, yeah, there's an, another, there's a number of um, collision repair shops that may have different kinds of contaminants that they work with. Um, DOT had also had comments on the travel demand analysis in its November 20th letter um, that I don't think there was time to address. So, any other? I just want to add, um, with regards to the school bus and your um, you're accused from this application. We just heard Wait, the oh, on the other one. You on mean. the other one, the site that was where currently the parking spaces are uh, for uh, buses, the bus parking spaces. That we reviewed an application last week. Mm -hmm. The chair just said that. Right. Yeah. Well, you she said, said that, that they said. filed an, yeah. uh, with DOB to okay. make uh, to build a school on that right. site. Right. And, and right. therefore, right. they found another yeah, lease. Oh, I didn't realize that was that our site. <laughs> That's because I'm recused, so I didn't realize it was our site. And I, I just wanted to add that that is the site we reviewed. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. I did have a question on the uh, the 14th Avenue. The uh, application um, submission does, does show photos of uh, the activities in the existing, but I went through the files and we do not have an existing plan of um, the floor by floor plans, that is, of the existing facility. So it was a little difficult to, for 14th Avenue. For yeah. 14th Avenue. So it was difficult right. to kind of associate those photographs, um, even though it did have a cut floor plan, it was not quite clear in relation to the existing building where it's located. So if the applicant can provide the existing floor plan um, of the other, of the other sites, for the, other the 14th Avenue. Uh, We've talked about this at the other hearings, and we've asked for the existing plans, and we talk about them as the cats and beer. You know, we, we talked at length at a prior hearing about the um, multi-purpose versus the lunchrooms, mm -hmm. and we kept talking over and over and over again about those other rooms and saying we don't actually understand what those are because we don't have drawings. So um, we've asked for that many times. Any other comments? I, I have a question regarding the lease. The lease says that they're going to be renting or leasing 10,000 out of 26,000 square feet. But I, I'm, I'm not an expert in this. But it doesn't, it doesn't indicate where are these 10,000 will be located, meaning that the relative location of these 10,000 square feet with respect to the rest of the site is, is a lease like this from the legal perspective is okay? Um, that's an interesting question. Most of the time you know you're, you're renting unit 3A and it yeah. has 10,000 square feet. Yeah. And on their other um, lease, I think it says you're renting parking spaces 1 through 33 yeah. or something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. okay, we can ask for more clarification. <coughs> Item uh, one. Item number 18, 2017, 192 BC, 5402, 5414, Fort Hamilton Parkway, Brooklyn. Okay. 
Okay. Um, so we had asked for clarification on the trip generation and modal split analysis that um, was being used in the analysis. Um, and the um, city planning confirmed with specific outreach by staff to city planning that the 103.4 trips per thousand gross square feet um, using 24% auto modal split is the right number to be using uh, and the right combination. Um, the project has been modified to eliminate the retail, <coughs> which has the effect of eliminating the requirement for 14 spaces for the retail and relying on the demand study for ambulatory diagnostic, which according to the study is 88 spaces and 88 spaces are being provided. The last version of the project required 93 spaces, allowing for retail and ambulatory care. So they were willing to give up their retail for five spaces. Um, so I think that responds to the issues, unless others others have comments. I just want to put in uh, just to note that this retail space was actually going to be the pharmacy, which is going to be used in tandem with the building. So. I just, in terms of the analysis, this, it was, I personally don't think it would have triggered a separate set of vehicular traffic, but that's how the analysis is done because it's a retail space. But if we were to restrict, just as a theoretical exercise, if we were to limit the use to just pharmacy related uses, then maybe we could, I'm just. Yeah, I understand what you're right. saying. When, when you're, in hospitals that have pharmacies in the hospital, mm -hmm. it only handles drugs, right? And maybe you can buy something, you know, a candy or something like that to bring to a patient upstairs, but basically it's only handling the right. drugs. In this case, it would have been rented because it's used group six, perhaps to a Dwayne Reed, and now that's not patient-based. That's community needs for Dwayne Reed or something. So unless the use was really a restricted use to pharmacy for the pharmacy, which is a different right. thing than a retail um, thing that provides whatever. With access only from only inside, inside the, the building. building. Right, right. Because right. right. you do see that on some of the accessory, like accessory restaurants to hotels, for example, mm -hmm. where the only access is from inside the building. Mm -hmm. So you can do that in places like apartment hotels where they're in a, in a residence district. If they're willing to make that restriction, I'd be okay with it. I'm not sure if they're willing to make that restriction. But I think that they don't need us involved. So once it becomes use group four, right. um, they can right. go to DOB and say, this is the pharmacy associated only with, and then it's DOB's decision about yeah, how whether they restrict they access. Okay. So whether it's urgent care or versus pharmacy exclusively for the facility, it doesn't matter. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying this is a DOB. Okay. Once it has to be use group four, DOB has to decide that the use is accessory to the principal okay. use. Okay. That, that's all I have to say, right? <laughs> okay. I, I just want to make, so, make myself clear here. My, my position during the uh, last hearing was that it, it wasn't like very tough to build an additional sub -seller. I had comments during the last executive session that I, I have received response to them during the last hearing, and I'm okay with that since they elected to argue about the parking study and, and prove it to us that the numbers, based on the numbers from the parking study, they don't need to like build an additional floor. But I just want to like make it clear that I was not convinced by res kind of the response that I got during the uh, last year. Understood. So it would have been a totally different thing if they still had a demand of 100 spaces or something like that. Exactly. And then they're still saying, well, we have parking on the street to rely on. That's not our standard. Yes. Right. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay, item number 19, 2017-244-BZ, 2208 Bowler Avenue, the Bronx. Well, they're keeping the architecture profession quite busy with this project. This mm -hmm. is the <laughs> at least the third complete new design. And I do have to say, the architects do a really good job. They're, all the projects have been really nice. <laughs> and I'm sorry that they have to start all over. <laughs> so it's completely redesigned in part to comply with flood regulations. 
so eliminated entirely the 7,500 square foot cellar. Mm -hmm. um, it retains the building height at approximately 38 feet to the roof, um, where there's a partial third floor from measured from grade. Um, it always had sort of some kind of version on a partial third floor, either split left right, or in this case, all of it's on the left. Um, and it's uh, also still 47.6 to the top of the bulkhead from grade. Um, I, I think the floor area went up for, um, to 18,904 zoning square feet from 16,643 zoning square feet. So it's an increase in the ask, but then they lost their seller, right? Um, uh, but there's actually no way to verify. The reason I say think is because they provided no floor area calculation chart. Each drawing should show how much floor area is on the floor, and instead it, the floor area number only appears on our um, BSA calculation sheet, which is not, a, not scientific, you know. So we need a zoning calculation chart on the drawings. Um, with respect to the programmatic needs analysis, the first, second, and third floors are indicated as having offices and classrooms for an after-school program, but its hours are 7.30 a to 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. So I don't understand how that's an after-school program. Um, and how was it determined how many rooms are needed for these activities? I think we didn't pursue the programmatic needs as intensely on this, though we should have. Um, because it's really a new application um, as opposed to uh, an amendment of an old application, right? Um, the elevations also, because it's a new architect, so the <coughs> architect is not showing the elevations in NAVD 88. In some drawings there, um, National Geodetic Survey, so it's NGVD or height above grade. You can use all of those, but one of those numbers has to be NAVD 88, um, and consistently so. The survey, notably, is in NGVD, um, and that, so the architect is then required to do all the calculations on turning it into NAVD 88. The, the survey really should be amended to reflect what is the standard now at the Department of Buildings. I don't think buildings will approve will review their application with a survey that's not in NAVD 88. Um, it looks like grade is approximately at elevation 14 under NAVD 88, um, but this must be verified and noted on the drawings. Um, the zoning drawing should show what the dimensions are referring to um, and cite to the zoning resolution section that applies, such as front yard, side yard, height, setback, and sky exposure plane. Um, there are maximum lot coverage regulations also that are applicable here to this site under section 24-11, which requires 60% for corner lots. The zoning chart indicates that lot coverage is not inapplicable, so that's a mistake. Um, there isn't also an objection for lot coverage only for open space, which is inapplicable in an R3A. Um, also, there is an objection for Section 25-18, which is about how many parking spaces you can provide on a site. You know, you take the site and you divide by 400 square feet, and that's how many spaces. They're not providing any parking, so it's not a it's not an applicable section. Um, instead, there it's a waiver of Section 25-31-31, um, which is indicated on the objection sheet. I just want to say, all this is just sloppy and I just hope that the applicant isn't penalized for the sloppiness when they go to DOB and there aren't waivers from us for the things that DOB shows in their objections because um, we can't waive something that's not being um, relied upon. The zoning calculation chart has some errors where it doesn't show that a waiver is needed for height and implies compliance with front and side yard so it says, um, quote, N over 15, unquote, N over 8, unquote. I don't know what that means. So um, they need to provide cellar drawings showing the detention tank, elevator pit, and crawl space, which you see in the section, but not there's no cellar drawing. Even though there is a cellar, effectively, the building's lifted up above the above 
grade to allow for these things. Um, the elevations need to show proposed materials, um, and the rooftop playground needs noise analysis and sound attenuation. Um, there is a letter from the Co-op City parking garage stating that the congregation is permitted to park there at reduced rates. The requested waiver is 24 spaces by us. Um, the applicant also provided a membership radius map showing 50% of the congregation is located within a three-quarter mile walk, which is the maximum <coughs> distance to qualify for the City Planning House of Worship parking waiver under 2535. However, that waiver requires the mi a minimum of 75% of the congregants living within that distance. Um, the parking utilization study doesn't actually tell us what the peak demand is for this facility. Um, the building has nearly 19,000 square feet and the discussion is about 22 parishioners. So that's quite confusing in terms of the parking analysis. Um, what about staff and students and daycare and people coming for counseling and Sunday dinners and so on and so on? The statement of facts says a survey on October 2017 had 113 congregants at the 11 a.m. service. So selecting 22 parishioners seems is odd. Or maybe they can explain how they came up with that. Um, we had also asked that the applicant establish that on holidays there are more people than usual than usual congregants attending the services. That's to justify the size of the um, sanctuary. sanctuary and the space upstairs. Um, the sidewalk on Erskine near Hunter is only five foot seven inches wide. I think it should be widened and discussed with DOT so that when parishioners are coming out after an event they're not falling out onto the street, which <coughs> happened even on a site visit. You couldn't actually really stand on the sidewalk. Um, and I'd like to know the status of the seeker review. The WRP and the noise were open. We received um, a new submission for both WRP and noise. Okay. And the noise does include a playground impact. They say there's no impact, so we sent that over to the other comments? No. no? Item number 20, 2018-10-BZ, 1238 East 26th Street, Brooklyn. Um, with respect to the existing encroachment um, within the required rear yard, uh, which we asked them to clear up, plans were provided showing DOB quote, acceptance in 1996, stating that they were filed to, quote, legalize the rear yard encroachment by a greenhouse. In any event, the proposed project would legalize the rear yard encroachment since it is no longer a greenhouse, so it wouldn't qualify. Um, with respect to the side yard depth reduction, which I asked them to uh, clarify on the drawings, the explanation on the drawings and the cover letter is incorrect, so I'm going to right now walk them through what it should have said. Zoning Resolution 23-32 requires a minimum lot width of 40 feet for single-family homes in an R2. This is a 30-foot wide lot. Section 23-461 requires in an R2 two side yards with a minimum width of 5 feet and a total width of 13 feet. Section 23-48 allows in an R2 the reduction of the total required side yard width by four inches for every one foot that the lot is less than the required 40 foot width to a minimum of five feet each side. So, um, so it's a 40 by 30 lot. I mean, sorry, 40 minus 30, sorry, sorry. It's 40 minus 30 is 10 times 4 inches, 10 feet, minus 10 times 4 inches equals 40 inches, equals 3 foot 4 inches. So you take the required 13 foot combined width, minus 3 foot 4, and you get 9 foot 6 total. Um, minimum of 5 each side, but they have an existing, a pre-existing non-complying 3 foot something side yard. Um, so the total width of side yards proposed is 10 feet. And so it's okay. So that's what they need to show on their drawings or they'll get bumped back from DOB actually. Um, the FAR was brought down by creating a double height bedroom at the second floor to the attic. 
<laughs> at the last hearing, I asked that the second floor be pulled back to be respectful of immediate neighbors who have complying rear yards at that floor. This wasn't done and should be. There's ample room to do it based on the layout, especially at the attic level where it's just a double height space. So they should provide a 25 foot rear yard at the second floor. Um, the, they did bring the height down. Um, and I, I do think that the design with that kind of crenellated roof line works quite well. It's better than most of the time what we see with one continuous um, attic line. Um, they need to amend the note on the drawing about um, the preservation of existing materials. So it should say, because it doesn't, removal of existing walls and or joists in excess of that shown on the approved plans will void the special permit. Anybody else? Item number 21, 2018, 18BZ, 2250 Linden Boulevard, Brooklyn. The applicant has submitted that he paid the ECB fine of 2530 oh. this morning. Really? Yeah, okay. unfortunately I can't forward it to you because I, for some reason I can't get my email now. Okay. So, and I they have proof of payment. Yeah, he has an email. Oh, wait. Let's see if I can get it up. Not still, not, not loading. I saw it this morning. Tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. So is that the only, that was not the only hey, one though, right? Hey. Is that the only one, <coughs> Carol? Yeah, that was the only one. That was the only one, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was the only one with a, okay. well, there were also, I don't exactly understand how these work, but they're related to the um, fact of having this occupancy without BSA approval. There are DOB civil penalties also shown as owing, and um, it's for failure to certify correction or something like that. Um, and they show $1,500, but I don't really know how that works with those civil penalties. Maybe we could talk about that or Chase can explain it. Um, the cover letter, community board voted, we, we didn't have a community board decision on this before, they voted to recommend approval. Um, the cover letter appears to be mixing up east and west and addresses um, in trying to make take us through the history. So looking at the drawings, the because the north arrow is pointing down, so that's the reason why it's confusing, I think. Looking at the drawings, the building to the east is 2228 <coughs> Linden, known as Building A, and was the <coughs> subject of a 1,760 square foot enlargement in 1991, which widened the building from 50 to 72 feet. Building B to the west is 2250 Linden and is 84, ten, 84 foot 10 inches wide and was not enlarged. The DOB objection sheet refers to both buildings on the lot, 2228 and 2250. But to clarify, each of these buildings has their own CO issued 1981. And the reason for talking about this was at one point the applicant was arguing that they're all one building. DOB does not treat them as one building. They don't look like one building. They don't, they don't meet the definition of one building. And they each have a C of O. So I'm not sure if it's relevant anymore because their concern was about continuity of use. Um, on photo four that was submitted in September 25th, and on the survey um, submitted on um, the 20th, there's a, stretch, a structure on the sidewalk um, uh, on Ashford, Ashford that's shown on both the photo and the survey. That needs to be removed. It's sitting on the sidewalk and it's in front of the property, so it must belong to the property owner. Um, so now we won't need to talk about the fines. Are you talking about the shed that is along Ashford uh, in the rear of the building? No, it's on Ashford, actually on it. And if you look, you don't see it on the drawings. If you see it on the survey, there is a rectangular metal structure <coughs> on the sidewalk. Um, and the survey was submitted, I say 920. Um, well, there. it looks like a bench in the photo. Is that the one? No, it looks like a metal box. So, and in the photo, it was submitted, what did I say, nine, 925 photo number four. Mm hmm There. Yeah, it looks, it looks like it could be a bench, maybe. Really? No, that yeah. big metal thing on photo this? number four? No, no. Go back. Um, slide the, draw, the image up. 
that, there's that a photo. That's, oh, yeah, go to the right. Yeah. To the right. To the oh, right okay. of the drawing. But that's the, this oh, is the you, door? Yeah, that thing. Oh, like a sliding gate. No, but it's protruding, and the survey oh. shows it sitting on the sidewalk. So, okay. So they need to explain what that is, but they're not allowed to have it. It sounds <laughs> like it's a part of the gate. What? But it does have like it a, sounds like it's a, a part of the gate. Thing. It's, but like it, it's on the survey, it's someplace. showing that it's extending onto the sidewalk by three or four feet. Yeah, yeah, okay. I see what you mean. Um, and then they, this one, they provided alternates for the parking layouts, uh, so which we could discuss my, uh, who, what people prefer. My preference is to discourage storage in the fenced-in area by a lot because it's being used as trash storage and debris um, by allowing parking or require the area be landscaped. Um, the parking has to be parking has to be striped. Um, that area is adjacent to a residence, and the 2018 satellite imagery shows a very large semi-trailer semi and general storage in that lot. Um, the trailer must have gotten there by driving over the curb, because there's no curb cut. Um, it's the curb on Cleveland. Um, so I think all of the fencing, um, in general, I think all of the fencing should include Include privacy slatting, and we need to be sure there is only one entry point from Linden, um, and not from the residential side streets. Um, the tree pit um, should be requested of Department of Parks now, and for and um, and in that location to prevent um, driving on Cleveland over the curb. So there was a comment by the applicant that I can't request a. a a tree now because it's the winter? No, that's actually when you request the tree so they install in the spring. It takes a little while for DOB, DO, Department of Parks to get you on their mm -hmm. list and so on. So, any other comments on this? No. no? Okay. Any preferences about what happens with that area at the back, which they show as either parking or not parking? I, I think the... Uh, I would prefer the entire space being shown as a parking. Um, as you indicated, it does avert the issue of it being used as storage and other, and even if it's not being used, at least we know that's what it's being designated for and not just as miscellaneous. Yeah. Yeah. And we hope the business will be successful. There'll be more tenants, more people coming. Right. So there might be a need for it. And, and it's not like there is any change in the layout that's happening. It is already possible. Yes, well, Without, it's already used that way. It is used that way, right? It's used as parking, but for every imaginable other thing. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Item number 22, 2018-54BZ. 761 Sheridan Avenue, also 757 Concourse Village West, the Bronx. It's a charter school. All right. um, a number of changes were made to the plans. Um, so I have a question. Um, why was the private vehicle no standing zone reduced from 100 feet to 72 feet? They didn't explain. They just said that it was. I don't know why. Um, and then on the elevations, there's um, a new kind of designation that says masonry look so to me that's code for my not favorite material so a masonry look needs to be specified what what is it um, and it cannot be exterior insulation and finish systems um, the operational plan for arrivals and dismissal management should be included in the resolution because it's quite um, because the board had a concern that had to do with caregivers picking up children and leaving their cars unattended. The original idea was they get they leave their car and they go inside and they find their kid and they bring it, put the kid back. That's not going to work. So under the plan now, children will be escorted to buses, to caregivers at the sidewalk, or to waiting cars. Um, we have a conditional DEP sign off on air quality and noise. Um, I don't think the measurements on the roof plan, though, are accurate, correct? Yes, yeah. correct. And they, we, so the applicant actually realized that because there's a typo within the EAS, oh. 
contend that but the roof plan is correct actually and it the is. figures in the EAS are correct but the narrative has an inc incorrect measurement ah. so we actually reached out on Friday to the to revise the letter okay so there's two another question about that so on the drawings you don't see this very often there's two there are two north arrows one says True North, and the other says Project North. Mm -hmm. And DEP's instructions are, on the north side put here, on the south side put here. Which north are we talking about? So we need to know what DEP is thinking, and the best would be for them to indicate to us um, a little more information instead of saying north and south, mm -hmm. front, rear, something. And actually, on the, on the um, roof plan, the roof, the building is held sort of in isolation as though it's not sitting on a lot. You don't know what the confines of the lot, uh, lot lines are. So when DEP directs you to have the stacks located X distance from the rear lot line, you can't tell whether that's what was done. So it should include the rear lot, all the lot lines, and then measure from those. Um, okay. And then DOT also provided a conditional sign-off that requires traffic studies. Um, so we'll make that a condition to approval, but we talked about this with staff that we need a restrictive declaration for the DOT school safety compliance because they really do have to do these traffic studies. That was, that was the deal. So right? they didn't share one with us yet, but they, my understanding based on what they told me is that they drafted one and it's okay. being reviewed by the owner and ah. the lessee, which is the school. Okay, and then we'll give and it to us. Okay. Hopefully they can do this quickly so we have time to review it. <coughs> okay. Any other comments on it? I was thinking they were reducing the um, size of the school no standing personal vehicle. Um, space to 72 feet because now you're no longer leaving your vehicle to go in and so I figured they could process them mm -hmm. more rapidly the cars coming because they're bringing the students out mm -hmm. but they should clarify that okay. I'd like some clarity on the protective measures that are going to be taken when taking the students out to the sidewalk uh, naturally not every parent's going to uh, not every parent's going to be on time, and I just want to know how they're going to account for the students that, when taking that many students out the sidewalk, how that's going to work. Mm -hmm. I know, especially like many schools for small children, uh, require that you have to go to the um, the gym or the cafeteria mm -hmm. or the outside uh, the outside um, park. Uh, where it's gated out and uh, each child leaves with a parent um, or, or gets on a bus through the whatever location. But I just want to know how that works. So how does it work when in those, in those other places where a parent is driving to the school? So they have um, a parking lot. For about 15 minutes. Uh, some have parking lots. <laughs> and, and and some others for about 15 minutes. The There's a lot of them parked cars. There's a lot of parking and no standing. There's a yep, lot of yep. parking in driveways. And that that's that's true. Uh, that's I, what we're trying I would to never imagine. do such a thing myself when picking up my children. But um, <laughs> <laughs> that that is that is certainly one of the things that does happen. Although the there is you know there's a cost benefit analysis, and there, there's a cost benefit analysis in that particular case, especially when dealing with kindergartners or pre K. When in that particular case they're getting out of a out of a park that's where the pickup is the children are in an enclosed school park and yeah, but not always that here. not always not, the school not always across from my building doesn't um, disperse their children from a park they literally come right out on the major street sidewalk and the parents are the teachers are kind of holding the kids back behind them and the kids mm -hmm. are going that's my mom that's my dad <laughs> oh my over God. there you know, like, that's my aunt and then they're darting in and out and you just you know living there mm -hmm. and driving there you just have to come to a halt for like the 10 minutes i always try and avoid that at all wow. times because but you're literally everybody stopped because they're triple parking the traffic means the so traffic in regulations some schools are. we hear about the ones that are managed in a way that's almost like a Swiss watch they have walkie-talkies 
and mm -hmm. the there's a monitor out on the sidewalk who calls the to parents. the cafeteria and said junior's mom is here send him out right as opposed to having all the kids come out I mean, maybe so there's a way of doing there, something like that. There's a lot of different methods. I just want to know what theirs is we don't, to make right, sure we don't that know. it's it's a safe one yeah. and 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 one that can alleviate as many harms as possible. I, I think on paper it seemed like they were trying to do that, you know, by saying that the bus monitor will be the person who does the escorting. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's one of those things that things don't always translate into reality. Right. You could write it down and have the best intentions, and then whatever reason it's organized or disorganized chaos at dismissal <laughs> time that's just what it is the only thing that gave me you know a little comfort was that there are other schools on that block and literally when I went around there I went when school was opening in the morning and they were very strict about who could proceed and when they could proceed down that block so they literally had a crossing monitor right smack in the middle of the intersection who was like like that and you just couldn't budge so mm -hmm. I felt to myself okay fine at least they're really controlling entrance onto this street during arrival so they probably do the same during dismissal mm -hmm. okay all right thank you okay new cases item number one 2016-1208 BZ 300 East 64th Street Manhattan I know the board hasn't been able, has not. Oh, this is the PCE? Okay. So, um, I will tell the board that um, we received a complaint from a neighbor who is, this is a condominium apparently, and there's the, a doctor who is above the Barry's Boot Camp who is complaining about noise. Okay, so. And he will be here for the hearing, so. Okay, so to this point, like we do with a lot of applications that end up being legalizations, um, we ask for notice to be posted for the next hearing, to be posted in the lobby of the um, apartment building, um, and that the notice must be very clear that people interested in submitting testimony can submit it in writing to submit for att and or attend the hearing, and that it has to be very clear in the notice. Right. Okay, so. Um, and we don't have to sign up from Fire Department or DOI. Mm -hmm. I'll just send out DOI today, but Fire Department, I don't know if we'll be able to. It wasn't on the lineup. And this is really one issue. Yeah. yeah. Well, and you know, in their defense, it was filed in 2016 during a time when Fire Department was requiring sprinklers of all of be installed, right? And um, since then, Fire Departments and Buildings Department has changed their approach. So now we can, we're getting a lot of these 2016s that turned into legalizations. Um. Okay. <clears throat> Item number two. Oh, may I go on? Just a second. Okay. 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 <laughs> Item number two, 2016-4240 BC. 1231 3rd Avenue, it, Manhattan. Wait a minute. No, you missed 4311. 40, 40, that's, that's being postponed. Oh, I have it as number six. Maybe it yes, got I mixed guess, up. Yeah, I'm sorry. 4311 um, is 1926 yeah. East 21st Street, Brooklyn. This is being postponed. Right. They failure to provide nurse notice. Well, there was a submission that was supposed to be met. This uh, is submission date that was supposed to be met, and it didn't happen. So we also didn't send the notice out. So no, the so reason for postponing a submission date on a new case. There was some additional information. Um, yep, yeah, but we often continue even though they didn't respond to the notice of comments. The big issue here was failure to serve notice right. because this is an application that was in process in 2011 and then the house burned down. And all of these years to get there to be an existing house that would therefore be then subsequently be the subject of an enlargement. Yeah. So um, I know we had said like February 12th. We're not picking a date. Yeah. yeah, or whatever. Okay. Okay, so then item number, that's number two, because my calendar is moved then. Item number three is 2016-4240. Okay. 
Court 240, 1231-3rd Avenue, Manhattan. Okay. This is a legalization. They opened in January of 2017. Um, again, if this is a 2016 application. We have proof of service of initial application to officials and of notice of hearing to officials and neighbors. The community board recommends approval. One letter was submitted in support. We have DOI. Um, fire department signed off, but I want to make sure that the applicant coordinates the notes from the fire department sign off on the drawings because I don't want the drawings to say something that's more stringent than what fire department required. Otherwise, that'll provide present problems in the future on future renewals with, with BSA. Also, maybe at DOB. Um, there is a spin studio in the cellar and residential on the upper floors. Um, the, the spin studio noise attenuation that's shown on the drawings is not treated as a box within a box. So it's possible that the transfer of vibration may not have been eliminated. So I think neighbors need to be notified of the next hearing date by posting the invitation in the lobby, inviting written comments or attendance at the hearing. Um, the spin studios are the a major source of aggravation for residents in buildings. Anybody else? Item number three, 2017-101-BZ, 10406 Rockaway Bull Beach Boulevard, Queens. We have proof of service of initial application to officials and of notice of hearing to officials and neighbors. Um, Community board recommendation. We don't have it. We don't have it. Need. Okay. I thought we did. I'm sorry. No. All right. I'll Why check says that. Community board recommendation. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so we have DOI. I gave yes. you DOI. Yeah. yeah. No, we need DOI. No, we have DOI. We have DOI. Uh, we have DOI. Sign off. FDNY. We have. We have DOI. Are you sure? Yeah. 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 yeah I so had it uploaded. This is not. Oh, you right? just uploaded? No, no. The other day. Friday or Saturday. This is Fern Fitness, right? Over the weekend. Fern, Fern yes. Fitness. Yes, yeah. we do have it. Yes, yeah. we have it. Right. Okay, so again, with fire department sign off, we need to make sure that the notes on the drawings are coordinated with the sign off and not more stringent in the notes than required by fire department. Or not less stringent than required by fire department. It just depends. Um, and then I like to know is the building. so. I think this had to do with lack of clarity in the statement of facts. It describes the PCE as having expanded into the adjacent building. Um, I don't think that what it expanded into was a building. I think it was just the adjacent retail space. Um, but it needs to be um, corrected because if it's expanding into a building and the building's on a different zoning lot that's not the subject of this application, then you need to, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. <laughs> so, um, so let's just clarify that. Okay. Item number four, 2017-293-BZ, 25 West 32nd Street, Manhattan. Okay, we have proof of service of initial application to officials and a notice of hearing to officials and neighbors. Community board waives its recommendation. We have DOI and fire department sign off. Anything else? Four of their massage licenses have expired. Oh. So they have to provide the updated ones. Unless those masseurs don't work there anymore. Um. Right. There was a notice of comments, and for some reason, the notice, the response, is not was not received. But um, most of, them but most of the issues are covered by fire department, so it seems irrelevant. I don't know, irrelevant kind of. What did you say? I didn't about understand. I said fire department? there was a re notice of comments that was issued asking about some fire fire safety stuff, and so it seems though that um, it wasn't responded to. But it seems like the fire department had signed off on it, so I don't know if it's. Still it, sort they of may not be relevant. Irrelevant, you know. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because a notice of comments was back in the day when we were asking for proof of installation or... Okay. Right. Right. So we thought that the fire department review would have superseded the comments anyway. Mm -hmm. So the, the statement of facts indicates that uh, 
it has an approved fire alarm but not operable sprinkler system. Are they aware of that, the fire department? Yes, yes. they're, yeah, they're aware. Letter. Okay. Yeah. And, and this is okay? Yeah, FDNY sent their letter to the premises protecting the fire alarm and fire suppression standby sprinkler system and the permits are covered. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Item number 5, 2018-148-BZ, 32 West 18th Street, Manhattan. Okay, we have proof of service of initial application to officials, add of notice of hearing to officials and neighbors. Community board waives its recommendation. I didn't find DOI or fire department on right. this one. Um, we do have a certificate of no effect from LPC though. You got fire department in there? Yeah. We didn't receive it. Maybe it came late. So anyway, we just need to make sure. And is this legislation or just this is proposed. proposed. It's under this construction. Is a 2018 application. Just submitted in September. Yeah, we do have fire department letter. Yeah. I email. Can I email the department? Fire department uh, has reviewed the above noted application. The application is for a PCE core power yoga to occupy part of the first floor with an occupant load of 75, 74 persons. These premises are protected by a fire suppression combination standpipe and sprinkler system and their permit is current with our department. The agency has no objection to this application. Okay. So we just need DOI. All right, we'll make sure that happens today. Okay, okay so then item number seven, 2017 309BZ, 406 Remsen Avenue, Brooklyn. Okay, we have proof of service of initial application to officials and of notice of hearing to officials and neighbors. I didn't find the community board recommendation and we really need it on this one. Um, okay. And the reason, I mean, we always need them, but we really need to hear from them because we have three very strong letters of objection from neighbors stating the operator is disrespectful, the cars parked are, are parked on the sidewalk and left overnight. Um, we do have a community board letter. It's 20 against. Oh. One, four, and three abstained. Where is and, it? Um, oh, wait, I, this is your notes. You didn't, okay. This is from my notes. Uh, community board, and it uh, picked up What was up it? Sorry, 20 20 opposed? against, uh, one, four, and three abstention. And that was recent. That was October that, 17. Right. Do they explain... Why? Um, health and safety concern, lack of bathroom facilities, surrounding areas not kept clean, garbage and construction debris stockpiled. Uh, they do not move the vehicles uh, on alternate uh, street side parking. Um, vehicle repairs are happening on East 38th Street. Parking vehicles, uh, their parking vehicles after repair on 58th Street and vehicles are parked on crosswalks in, uh, impeding uh, walkway access. Similar concerns that you got from the other from and the neighbor dogs. yes frightening dogs right which, that's actually yeah. <laughs> yeah which is very common on these kinds of places that keep a dog inside yeah. scare away intruders right um so we have the three strong letters of objection stating the operator is disrespectful cars parked on the sidewalk yes. and left overnight there is a 2016 oath stipulation yeah. that um, describes the results of DOB inspections indicating the site has been used for boat repair and storage, auto repairs, contractor's yard, and junk salvage. Um, both gave a compliance deadline of June 2017 or required filing for BSA variance by the same date. Um, as far as I can tell, the submission to BSA was six months late, made in December of 2017. Um, and I don't know whether BSA was aware that the stipulation also obligated the BSA to act by no December 30th, 2018, um, based on a June 2017 submission date. But I don't really know how OATH can determine how long it takes us to review an application that's submitted Our six months late. Would you right. Be, right. <laughs> so it's the first I read about it. I thought maybe they would have done you the favor of maybe making a phone call. I don't know. <laughs> um, the applicants did request, as required by the stipulation, an extension of time to file with the BSA by December 2017. During the pendency of the application at BSA, the stipulation states that the use is restricted to auto repairs and accessory auto storage and parking 
Um, it's not my impression that that's what they did, according to satellite imagery from this summer, which shows boats and mm -hmm. trash, and not to mention their own photos um, that show um, continued use as a storage yard. Um, so um, the proofs, proofs, though, were provided to establish use continuity, which was is required. So my first question is, what do we do about the parking on the sidewalk? The landlord apparently installed cameras and issued a penalty lease rider in June of this year that threatens eviction and some small amounts of $100 here and there for the cars legally parked. Um, I doubt that's been effective. I don't think it is working because if you look at the Google Street View, yeah. which is from October of 2018, after yeah. the installation, you still see vehicles parked on the sidewalk. Right. So do you want the owner and the landlord? Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. And the operator? Yes. yes. Here at the hearing tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Sorry, just a second. Um, the site photos show the site is chaotic and there is trash stored at the rear adjacent to residents. Mm -hmm. um, there is no fence to speak of. Um, the entire site has to be cleaned up now and then organized. I suggest a four foot high brick wall on all perimeters with a fence above to eight feet and in the rear dense landscaping, um, filling up that entire area that's currently used as storage. There is dense landscaping, it's just not theirs. No, no, no. You don't, you don't get to count it's, someone else's dense landscaping. It's the wilderness there. Yeah, okay. But, um, Provide, they need to provide a survey to show where fencing currently is, as some looks like it is forward of the property line. Um, there are also currently sort of two layers of fencing and far too many fencing types with too many openings where there are no curb cuts. The parking plan shows parking spaces in front of the curbs cut, so that's interesting. Um, it doesn't work. Um, Trash is shown adjacent to the residence. It needs to be moved to the other side and then be enclosed, and they need a lumen spread diagram. Other um, comments? I have, uh, this is probably one of the most chaotic automotive repair place I've seen, not just in terms of the way it's working, but the signage. Um, the signage drawings that are shown, and if and there's no dimensions on these signage, so they need to provide plans with the dimensions of the signage. And just eyeballing it with the site plan and others, they do not correspond with the square footage that is listed. So, and and it's it is very much well over whatever the requirement is, which the applicant has also acknowledged. But those need to be corrected before we approve it. Um, the parking lot, though the there is, uh, the plan shows parking for 13 vehicles, when you look at the Google map, uh, easily you can provide more parking spaces. And if there is a need for that many parking spaces, might as well just show those striped parking spaces and try to maximize it. It definitely is not functioning in the way the plan is showing in terms of the flow of the parking. So they need to reevaluate the parking and the servicing program and, and lay, lay out the space accordingly. Mm -hmm. that, and that may address some of the on-street parking, and I do think the elimination of the On street or side Oh, sorry, I keep saying that on street, I mean sidewalk, uh, on the sidewalk. And by eliminating one of the curb cuts, uh, which is anyway being blocked by parked vehicles, may add some on street parking. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, on street. On street. Okay. This time I'm using it. Okay. <laughs> so um, that that is just. Uh, so there was also a comment which we don't have experience with from the community board that, or that they're. Um, not obeying alternate side of the street parking, which means that they're using the street That's to do right. their repairs, yeah. right? And they're keeping all of their cars on the street, which they're not supposed to be doing. I mean, sometimes, you know, we see these kinds of things where it's great that it's such a busy business, but maybe it's not such a busy business, otherwise they wouldn't be storing contractors, supplies, and all of this other stuff, a boat, mm -hmm. all of those other things, if they would stick to the use for which they received an approval, they might actually have room to put the cars that are coming on for repairs. 
they should also uh, clarify that no public parking is occurring. There. Right. Also, it wasn't quite clear to me um, what is the nature of the business. I mean, are there separate operators, or is it the same business but they have different functions, and each one of these rooms serve those different functions? Um, because as part of the last extension, uh, there was they were not allowed to have any storing or selling of vehicles, and there was a requirement of soundproofing to be provided, um, and that all repairs be done indoors. So I'm not sure. It doesn't seem like it's happening now. No, clearly not. But um, we need to understand what was the nature of the operation and that prompted some of these requirements, and mm -hmm. what is it going forward? Um, well, some of this is like... And, isolated businesses because they have different phone numbers that's mm -hmm. that's kind of what I uh, so then there has to be a better coordination of all of these signage and the operation and that might be leading to this haphazard functioning of the space but then that there needs to be better understanding of that <coughs> well it's also they have different names one's top quality one's Peter Pan one's um, building center they might have some some auto sales because I can see some some cars yeah. without right. gates right. inside the property. Right. Well, those could be also a dealer car that's been brought that's there for saying. repair. Um, so that also could be. But we do need better interior site photos. Right. Um, the photos that were provided of the site, uh, it's too dark. It's very difficult to read. So also to better understand the interior site condition, we need those photos too. Mm -hmm. And because these are different operators, the signage becomes even more critical. Right, but so, How so do we here, determine the signage? So the landlord showed us, um, sent to us a compliance rider, right? But the, the, the approach is that there's one tenant. It's, this is the landlord's responsibility, right? If the landlord is renting and subdividing the space like that and can't control the five tenants or whatever it is, that's the landlord's responsibility. You can't ask each tenant to be responsible for the behavior of its neighbor, right? And um, when you look at, for instance, in front of the structure that has the transmission sign, there's clearly a truck that's been there forever because it's got pipes and corrugated metal. I'm just looking at the satellite, the Google Street View from June. Um, it's got pipes sitting on top of it. It's being used essentially as a storage structure. You, you mean a van? Yeah. The red yeah. van? Mm -hmm. No, I'm looking at the van. white one. It's on uh, the all the way on the corner um, inside. And if you do history, it's oh. been there pretty much for a long period of ah, time. Okay. And then, then there's also something that's called the rebuilding center. I don't know if that's rebuilding an engine or rebuilding your house <laughs> because that's the storage of contractors materials is one of the issues as a matter of fact in one of the google views there were photos uh one of the one of them showed like steel frames mm -hmm. on site so um, right here. it yeah. has been used for other right purposes also um and then who is responsible for this owner or one of the tenants the owner ultimately is responsible for everything so then the owner that has to be here and yes uh, and the owner's job is to make sure their his his or her tenants are not causing mm -hmm. um, nuisance, which they clearly are. Um, and it's yeah, and every image I look at has cars parked on the sidewalk. No matter which time mm -hmm. you look, no mm -hmm. matter who provides the image. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Item number 8, 2018 48BZ, 5205 Highland Boulevard, Staten Island. Sorry, I get my Highland or Highland. Okay, there we go. Um, we have proof of service of initial application to officials and of notice of hearing to officials and neighbors. Community board recommends approval. Um, city planning provided a letter as well and recommends elimination of the 28 foot curb cut that is too close to the intersection and that the continuous 185 foot long curb cut be corrected to match the plans by installing curbs and sidewalks. Um, existing conditions <coughs> plans don't match the photos. 
<coughs> the proposal is to legalize the relocation of a seven by seven illuminated sign from one corner of the lot to the other and to permit the attendance booth. Um, the site generally looks good, but privacy slatting has to be replaced. Cracked drive areas need to be repaired, resurfaced, and miscellaneous trash stored on the site of the building has to be removed. Approved plans actually showed that area with border landscaping, which wasn't done. All the drawings show it with landscaping, and it's not done. I don't even <coughs> understand that. It's showing it existing, proposed, approved, and none of it's done. I don't get that. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, plans do not indicate all the sign numbers as per the sign chart. Um, the sign analysis is not clear, and I do not believe it corresponds with the plan. Um, and as per the Google view, it seems there are excess signage uh, on the north side especially. Um, is the operator planning to provide landscaping? As um, Well, they they're required to. to. They're required, OK. Yeah. Uh, the other. I just want them to confirm. I think from the photos, it seems it has been installed. Um, but if they can just uh, affirm that in narrative, uh, right. that a sidewalk along the Arbutus uh, was installed for the 1994 approval. That was one of the requirements of the 1994 approval. A sidewalk? Um, that a sidewalk be installed uh, along Arbutus. I guess it was not a formal sidewalk. It was just, uh, it is there. It, yeah. It's just as part of the 1994 condition. I think statement. that might have been about getting rid of a curb cut. Oh, is it? Yeah. Then it's not clear from whatever the condition was and if that has been addressed or not. Uh, plans, uh, the plan needs to include vacuum and air pump and ice box. Uh, there are vending machines stacked against the attendant booth. And my question is, is the area ADA accessible? If not, it needs to be and relocate the vending machines. Um, also, the tire rack is located outside the building. That's what I saw from one yeah. of the Google view, and that needs to be inside the building. Mm -hmm. Also, a question as to whether they of time. Sorry, thank you. Uh, question of whether they need to request an extension of time to obtain a CO. I think there was a CO. There was a condition. Condition yeah. that they yeah. obtain it by a certain period. Yeah. And they didn't. And they, they did. Yeah, they, they have it in the. the they would. Lineup. Yes. And and the waiver. And the waiver. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the question is, do they need or they need? They need, yeah. They need. If they, yeah. Unless they obtain the CFO. Unless they, yeah, I did in fact obtain the CFO. Okay. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Finished? Yep. This, could, this is the last case. Uh, this concludes the public review session of December 10, 2018.